Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, as usual, we will give it a minute to let everybody jump into the webinar. I hope everybody's having a good week so far. We have a great presentation today, and as usual, a number of uh, really great panelists here as well to answer questions and hopefully encourage a really great discussion today. Uh, before we get started with our presentation, we will, as usual, uh, get into a couple of our weekly updates. Uh, Dr. Huja, I'll start with you today. Thanks so much for providing the, these updates every week. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning we have 27 COVID patients in our hospital with 10 in the ICU. Um, the, fortunately, the numbers have stabilized over the past few weeks and I'll show you a little bit of the trends, but I do want to show you this part, which is that we have had some uh, indications that the data may have been underreported into the CalReady system. So this was kind of the county's system in which the numbers are um, accumulated and accounted for. And it looks like that has been corrected. So we may see, if we do see a slight uptick or plateau, it's you know in part of those numbers being reconciled. But fortunately, we're not seeing that dramatic uptick that we did see in, uh, in July. The peak still remained July 24th, where we had 41 patients and 15 in our ICU. And as I mentioned, you know, we're down to 27 today. The non-COVID volumes remain quite high. And I think this is, you know, a great thing for our hospital and for our teams, but it has made it quite busy. Medicine and ICU have had surge team activations and several consulting services, nephrology and ID remain busy. The surgical services are back to, you know, pre-COVID volumes and activity as well. Looking through our numbers, so from March 1st to August 9th, we've had a total of 317 at SHC. Further breaking down the SHC numbers, our ICU rates remain stable. We haven't gone above this percentage in this time. Our death rate also remains stable. We've stayed under 5%, and the females comprise just slightly more of our population as before. Looking at the age demographics, we initially saw a little bit more in the younger age group. I think it's now settled here with only 25% or so being in the uh, older than 70 age group. And there were 32 children that have been admitted to the Children's Hospital since March 1st with COVID being the primary reason for admission. Finally, just looking at the breakdown between the ICU in red and the wards, um, you can see that fortunately, we don't have a high percentage of patients going into uh, the ICU and we see the numbers starting to plateau. And then finally, thank you to my data team and I'll stop here. Thanks, Errol. Thanks so much, Dr. Huja. And then next we have Dr. Ben Pinsky, who's gonna update us on the new strand specific uh, DNA test. Thank you, Errol, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm just going to give a brief update on our strand-specific uh, CoV-2 RT-PCR. Um, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, this went live on uh, July 31st, so now orderable. Um, and remember, this assay detects the minus strand RNA of the virus, which is a replicate, replicative intermediate in the viral life cycle shown over here in blue. And this uh, is associated with the presence of replicating virus. And there's recent data out of Hong Kong showing that this is associated with culturable uh, virus. Um, our lab test code is here. It's a little bit long, but lab and then strand CoV-2. So hopefully you'll be able to find that. I think there's useful synonyms in EPIC. Our turnaround time is similar to our regular test uh, from 24 to, four to 72 hours. Um, and it can be added on to any, um, any recently positive uh, sample and a separate collection is not re required. Um, it's intended to supplement and not replace current uh, time-based guidance for ending isolation. Um, so this is an important, uh, important point that, um, that we need to uh, continue these time-based guidances um, but this can help supplement uh, that information. Um, and we have a best practices alert that uh, talks about this. Um, and it's, uh, it will be useful and I think informative for folks when they have a moment to look at this data showing, um, showing the, um, that the virus is um, unlikely to be transmissible or culturable after 10 days uh, after onset of symptoms. Um, and again, here shows the information about um, 
that you can add this uh, test on to current testing. I apologize for the noise in the background. I'll finish up quickly. Um, here's just an example report um, showing uh, what, what information you will get when you order this test. There's two things. So this is a quantitative test. You will get the qualitative information. Uh, this was, uh, result was um, from um, a, a patient that um, unfortunately was pre-symptomatic when they were transferred to Stanford, was negative on admission testing and uh, we investigated that and was negative on multiple tests and then at a uh, discharge was positive. And we did strand specific PCR and you can see that the minus strand was positive in this individual and the plus strand which sort of acts as a um, which sort of acts as an internal control was detected. This is what we're primarily detecting in our non strand specific regular RT PCR. So this patient was detected uh, for both, and then you get some quantit sorry about that quantitative information uh, sixteen uh, the cycle threshold value was very early at sixteen, and the minus strand was um, also detected at actually a relatively early CT value for the minus strand of less than thirty so i 'm happy to take any questions um, in the chat, and um, I have to go answer the door because someone's going to fix our house. I really appreciate uh, your patience with that. Um, they were supposed to arrive about half hour from now. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Pinsky. I appreciate it. That test has been really helpful already uh, personally in our patients. So thanks so much for being a leader in our testing and for updating us regularly. You'll certainly get a number of questions I already see popping up. So Ben will start answering your questions um, uh, in the Q&A function. And we'll, of course, share those questions with you guys. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, uh, just an update for next week. We have, uh, welcoming back, Dr. Michelle Berry talking about the COVID-19 pandemic through the gender lens. Um, we're really excited to hear her speak on that. And the week after that, we're going to hear a talk from our own faculty as well, uh, talking about the COVID-19 effects of the GI tract and liver and effects in alcohol. Uh, so I'm going to turn the uh, welcome over. We have a special guest this week. Uh, I'm going to turn the welcome and introduction over to our chair, Dr. Harrington. Great. Thanks, Errol. And thanks, uh, Nira and Ben, for giving us an update on the clinical work as well as on the, uh, the work in the pathology lab. Um, we actually have two special guests today. The first is uh, joining us on the panel is uh, Dr. Rob Califf. Rob is uh, known to many of you for many years. He was at Duke University, where he was the vice chancellor of clinical and translational science. He's now a employee at Verily and Google Health, and uh, he is an adjunct professor here at, uh, at Stanford. Rob is also a former commissioner of the FDA, and so we thought he'd be a great addition to the panel uh, given this particular topic. So Rob, thanks for joining us today. Good to be here. It's a real pleasure to introduce a uh, long-standing friend and colleague, Professor Martin Landry, who you see his title here is the Professor of Medicine Epidemiology in the Newfield Department of Population Health at the University of Oxford in the UK. He's also the Interim Director of the Big Data Institute at Oxford. Martin plays a number of leadership roles in the international community, designed to really think about streamlining and making more efficient clinical trials to answer questions around common diseases. He's been a great friend and collaborator to many of us here at Stanford and has participated in all, I think, of our big data and biomedicine conferences going back to the inception. So we've really benefited from his expertise, his knowledge, and his willingness to share. Today is no different. He is the co-principal investigator of something called the, plat the, the uh, recovery trial, which is a platform for the performance of randomized clinical trials in a rapid fashion in the UK to try to answer questions quickly about potential treatments for, um, for COVID-19. Uh, Martin's agreed to, uh, to share with us both the the construct of recovery, as well as some of the interesting clinical data that's informing our practices as we speak today. So Rob, thanks for joining us. Martin, thanks for joining us. And I'll turn it over to you, Professor Landry. Thank you very much. And um, I'll just share my screen. So yes, thank you very much indeed for, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. I'm sorry I can't be in there in person. It would be much more fun. 
um, but I guess I wouldn't be giving this talk if I could be there in person. So I want to take us back a few, uh, only a few months um, to uh, late February, early March, when we were all looking ahead, particularly in the UK at that stage, um, to an imminent, imminent uh, health disaster, uh, a tsunami of cases of uh, COVID, a, new a disease caused by a new virus. When one thinks about COVID, uh, back in February, March, relatively little was known. Um, but what we did know was that for most people, this was going to be a self-limiting viral illness. But if you were unfortunate to end up in hospital, mortality might be 10 or 20 percent. Actually, from, as I'll show you in a moment, it's, some, it's somewhat higher than that, at least in the UK. And for patients who were uh, uh, on ventilation, then mortality might be as close to 50 percent. So if you end up in hospital, you've perhaps got a one in four or one in five chance of dying. If you end up uh, on a ventilator, it might be one, uh, one in two. Um, and the question is, uh, how does one treat that uh, uh, condition? As I've sort of alluded to, this is an unprecedented clinical challenge, one which uh, had the potential to massively overstretch even the most uh, sophisticated of health services, both in terms of the availability of beds, of staff, of ventilators, and which would put huge time pressures and personal stress on the front frontline medical team. Uh, similarly, it would of course put a uh, huge uh, burden upon the patients who would be in large numbers, very unwell, obviously anxious, uh, elderly and typically alone because of all the infection control measures. So a seriously challenging public health problem. Well, what about treatment? Well, there's huge therapeutic uncertainty. There are many candidates, there's still many candidate treatments. There are still, frankly, many opinions, and there's, uh, thank, there's uh, at the beginning, was no reliable data, and we're just beginning to chip away at that. But our thought process was that there was unlikely to be a single big win, but modest effects, moderate effects, might be plausible from a number of agents. And given the scale of the epidemic, reducing mortality by one fifth, say from 25% to 20%, or from 25,000 deaths to 20,000 deaths, would be a big achievement. And of course, if you could combine several treatments with modest effects, you might end up with quite big effects. Now there's precedent to all this, and I think it's really helpful to go back, look back in order to move forward. So here's a, a paper that uh, uh, some of my colleagues on the panel will remember, which is from 1984 from Salim Yusuf, Rory Collins and Richard Pito. Um, uh, all three of those uh, are still working in cardiovascular trials. Uh, two of them are still based with me in Oxford. Um, the hospital, the Radcliffe Infirmary, has long ceased, since to, be, uh, ceased to be a hospital, uh, but the CTSU is certainly ongoing. But the lesson that came there were, really was the recognition that in at least some cases, not necessarily in all cases, large simple randomized trials are the effects of uh, widely practicable treatments for common conditions um, could have a dramatic imp impact on mortality. And what did that look like? So as I was writing the protocol for the recovery trial, I had in front of me the protocol for the ISIS-2 trial. Uh, this is the uh, trial of streptokinase and aspirin in acute myocardial infarction. And right on the front page was this fundamental concept of di design. By far the most important determinant of success is the extent to which in those busy hospitals where the majority of acute, let's read COVID patients, are actually admitted, the responsible physicians and nurses choose to enter their patients. Hence the extra work must be and is absolutely minimal. Now that played out very well for that particular trial. There was a one page case report form, this is it. And the results are, are well known and these were uh, published actually whilst I was still a medical student, uh, demonstrating reductions in the risk of death following acute myocardial infarction of around about a quarter, both with aspirin and then with streptokinase, and of course, a combined effect, which is substantially greater. So that's history, but history is def very definitely relevant. When we're thinking about treatments for COVID, uh, as I said, there were many possible candidates, but in terms of prioritiz prioritization, our, our thought process is where we needed to choose treatments which were potentially effective. That's sort of obvious, but sometimes forgotten. 
uh, we needed to choose treatments or prioritize those where we understood the safety. They didn't have to be perfectly safe, but we broadly knew what we were dealing with. Where there was sufficient treatment available for large scale recruitment, but also where there was a potential to rap rapidly scale up that treatment if it was shown to be effective. No good at having a drug which is beautifully effective, but which cannot be manufactured, distributed, supplied, or, or paid for uh, on a truly uh, enormous scale. This leaves us with three broad categories of drugs, the antiviral treatments, immunomodulatory treatments, and then of course, treatments specifically targeted to this new virus. Well, back in Mar February, March time, there were no treatments targeted to this new virus uh, because it was a new virus. So uh, we started off uh, by studying a number of treatments and we, I've listed the full set here and I'll explain how we added them in over time. But the first were in the antiviral category was lapinavir ritonavir, a commonly used uh, treatment uh, for HIV, uh, thought to have some antiviral effects uh, in uh, other settings. Uh, hydroxychloroquine, of course, very widely used for decades for malaria and rheumatological conditions um, and well known uh, to, I think, everybody uh, uh, now. Convalescent plasma uh, containing antibodies from those who've recovered from COVID, of course, didn't really exist back in the beginning of March because, at least in the UK, nobody had had COVID. And then the immune system treatments, low dexamethasone, azithromycin and tocilizumab. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these. But in terms of design, it was all about keeping it simple. The, in terms of uh, COVID is a disease that can affect anybody. And therefore, uh, the trial is open uh, to everybody who gets admitted to hospital. There are no age criteria. Uh, pregnant women, breastfeeding women are, are eligible. Uh, all comorbidities are, are eligible. Of course, there may be contraindications to particular of the interventions, in which case patients wouldn't be randomized to those. Uh, but broadly speaking, any patient admitted could be, uh, could be randomized. The criteria were admission and proven or suspected uh, COV-2 infection. Why suspected? Because um, at least in the early days, there wasn't necessarily widespread testing. And even uh, more recently, there can be delays between presentation and, and getting the test confirmed. And the clinical uh, presentation of COVID in the middle of an outbreak uh, was deemed to be uh, fairly obvious. Indeed, if you didn't have COVID, you largely would struggle to get into a hospital in the peak of the outbreak. Patients were then randomized to no additional treatment. So everybody got the usual standard of care in which it, what, whatever that meant, wherever they were. Uh, so they randomized to no additional treatment to one of each of these uh, or, or to one of each of these additional treatments. Uh, the primary outcome was 28 day mortality. Uh, why, why mortality? because it's the thing that matters. Uh, the secondary outcomes were duration of hospitalization and the need for mechanical ventilation um, or progression to death. Uh, we introduced a uh, factorial randomization. So again, borrowing a trick from the, uh, initially from the cardiovascular clinical trials community. And that, addition, that factorial randomization is to convalescent plasma or control. And uh, we also, introduced a subsidiary uh, randomization for those sick who are the sickest patients, those with hypoxia and evidence of inflammation, uh, uh, evidence through the use of oxygen, low saturations, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, array uh, C-reactive protein. And those patients could be randomized to tocilizumab versus control. Why did we design it quite this way? Well, we started with something that was fairly simple. If I go back a couple of slides, um, as time went on and the trial was successful and enrollment was successful, it then proved possible to add in those additional treatments in particular types of patients. I said we needed to keep it simple, and so we did. So the case report form on the right looks remarkably similar to that one I showed you for the ISIS-2 trial from the mid-1980s. Very simple online uh, uh, data entry. Uh, the, design, the form was designed that it could be done uh, even by uh, clerical or medical uh, staff, uh, medical student staff, um, simply recording patient details, very simple inclusion criteria, chemo comorbidities, and if a patient was not suitable for any particular treatment. These, the uh, system uh, randomized, we use simple randomization, uh, a simple coin toss uh, between the available uh, treatments, and then uh, the treatment was in the form of the doctor's prescription. 
So the doctor was then asked to prescribe whatever the computer had determined. In terms of follow-up, there was one single follow-up form uh, to be completed at death, discharge or 28 days for those still in hospital, uh, where we recorded vital status, whether the patient had gone home, and you can see the other things about uh, uh, respiratory support, renal support, new cardiac arrhythmias, uh, and compliance or adherence to the uh, study treatment. One of the way, reasons that we were able to simplify things was because we live in a modern world in which the health systems collect enormous quantities of data. Uh, and so actually we we're able to track uh, vital status, uh, future hospital admissions, uh, hospital diagnoses whilst in admission, uh, and many other things besides through linkage to national data systems. This is not the detailed depths of the EHR system. One doesn't need the, the necessarily the level of depth but it ensures that one gets no loss of the follow-up. And in fact, we can have follow-up uh, complete to 28 days, even for those who are discharged, for six months, as we pre-specified. And we have permission to follow these people up for 10 years um, uh, to look for perhaps late-time complications of some of the therapies. This is what it looked like uh, on the ground. We involved 176 hosp acute hospitals across uh, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Uh, that is, uh, we involved every single acute hospital that was admitting patients uh, with COVID across the entire country. Uh, the, you can see that at the peak of the recruitment, we were recruiting around four or 500 patients per day. That has tailed off substantially. That peak was around uh, uh, Easter and just after, so uh, uh, during April. Uh, and um, uh, the, the caseload as as uh, I may, may, as you saw in one of the earlier slides, in the UK currently the caseload has uh, dramatically reduced, which is a really good thing, uh, but it means recruitment to the trial now is, uh, is slower than it was uh, some, some, some months ago. If one looks at that overall, uh, this slide was taken a, a couple of weeks ago, but this is, looks at the first 100 days of recruitment. And I tell you that uh, we wrote the protocol on the 9th and 10th of March. We randomized the first patients on the 19th of March. And eight weeks and nine minutes later, we randomized the 10,000th patient. You get a sense of the uh, speed and scale, both of the epidemic, but also of recruitment into the trial. The uh, uh, lines towards the bottom of the screen represent recruitment as of a few weeks ago uh, to the uh, tocilizumab and the convalescent plasma uh, arms. So what about results? Well, over, here's the uh, data on the first 12,100 patients uh, randomized, which is about where we are at the moment. Uh, around two thirds are male, which actually matches the uh, clinical picture that we see in hospitals in the UK. The mean age is 66, but what that doesn't tell you is that 20% of the patients were over the age of 80, and a further 20% of the patients are between 70 and 80 years old. Our youngest patient uh, was uh, less than six months, and our oldest was uh, well over 100 years. Uh, typically, patients present during the, uh, after about a week of symptoms. Uh, so uh, enrollment was typically about eight days after symptom onset. That's important to think about because we believe that the treat, the, this disease has two, at least two phases. There may be some overlap in the middle. Uh, an early viral phase and a later inflammatory phase. Uh, and uh, that's uh, perhaps it is an important piece of information to hold when interpreting the results. In terms of the levels of respiratory support, um, you can see that a, there's around 25% of the total population uh, were admitted to hospital, had COVID, but at the time of randomization did not need oxygen uh, supplementation. Uh, there were uh, nearly two thirds of the patients who required oxygen with or without non-invasive uh, ventilation. And then there are 13% uh, of the patients who required ventilation uh, or ECMO. In terms of comorbidities, uh, around 27% uh, had diabetes, 28% had cardiovascular disease, 22% had uh, lung disease, and overall uh, around 60 to 65% had some form of prior major comorbidity. And again, this pattern is exactly the sort of pattern that you see in the UK over the last few months. That's no great surprise because uh, roughly one in six of every patient that was admitted to a UK hospital was recruited into this trial. 
why one in six? That sounds sort of quite good. To me, it actually sounds not, but not terribly good. Um, I'd be much happier if it was one in two uh, or even greater. And one of the interesting things that we are exploring is that you do see patchy recruitment with even some uh, big teaching hospitals um, not necessarily having the best performance in terms of recruitment and perhaps recruiting only two or three percent of their total uh, caseload and some other hospitals particularly what we would call the district general hospitals but I guess they're your uh, uh, county and, and, and rural hospitals sometimes recruiting uh, 60 plus percent of all the patients that, that, uh, that are uh, admitted to their hospital. So in terms of uh, overall, uh, in terms of mortality, the, the primary endpoint is 28 day mortality. And uh, this is uh, again data from a couple of weeks ago, but really hasn't changed. Uh, what we saw was that uh, the total mortality is around about 25% overall. Um, uh, just, uh, just under half of that, mort of that mortality occurs in the first week or 10 days. Um, uh, and about uh, uh, two thirds of that within the first fortnight or so. There's a strong relationship with age and there's a strong uh, relationship with the need for respiratory support at the time of enrolment, neither of which are a great surprise, but again, they are important in terms of thinking about how one interprets the results. So what about results? Well, we have three results to talk about to date. Um, the first is a hydroxychloroquine. So uh, we randomized uh, uh, 4,700 patients uh, to hydroxychloroquine or usual care. It was a one to two randomization. Because we're comparing the usual care group with several other active arms, we have a, uh, a larger usual care group uh, than we did um, uh, any of the individual active arms. But what you can see is that again, mean age is 65, again, about two thirds are male, again, it's eight or nine days since symptom onset. Um, uh, and again, 57% uh, had uh, some form of uh, prior uh, disease. Now there's lots, been lots of hype, hope and speculation about hydroxychloroquine, but the results were um, compelling. In this group of patients who are admitted to hospital, who who have roughly speaking a one in four chance of, of dying, uh, then uh, the hydroxychloroquine uh, did not reduce the risk of death, nor did it reduce the risk of any of the secondary outcomes in terms of progression to uh, need for ventilation, uh, duration of hospitalization, and so on and so forth. Uh, this, uh, just to talk to the speed of recruitment and the speed of getting answers, uh, this, this particular arm was added to the protocol on the 21st of March. Uh, recruitment was stopped on the 5th of June uh, or, uh, after the Data Monitoring Committee, Committee had looked at the interim data and had advi advised us uh, that there was, um, uh, that essentially there was, no, there was little chance of uh, uh, seeing a, a, a clear benefit. And you can see the lower bound of that confidence interval of 0.96 really makes that makes that point. So uh, this uh, uh, result clearly got uh, widespread attention, as you would expect. I quite like the, the Guardian is a, slight, a, a slightly left leaning uh, national newspaper here in the UK, but it does do good health coverage. Uh, it's um, I think there's a nice juxtaposition of photographs, at least on that on that publication. And on the right, of course, 10 days later, the FDA uh, uh, withdrew the um, emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine. So if we move from hydroxychloroquine, a treatment that has been widely recommended, and in fact, if one looks at the guidelines, is first or second choice in most of the national, or was in most of the national and international guidelines, and turns instead to dexamethasone, which by contrast was by and large uh, either contraindicated um, or recommended to avoid in most of those guidelines. Now here is a slightly different story. When we were uh, planning the study, we frankly had no idea how big the epidemic would be. And we had um, uh, no idea how, what the event rate would be. We had no idea where, how, whether any of these drugs were going to be effective or how effective. And we didn't know how effective our recruit or efficient our recruitment was going to be. So uh, at the very onset, 
uh, it wasn't possible to do sample size calculations. If we, we could have done them, but they would have been uh, essentially guesswork um, for the sake of just producing a calculation. But what became rapidly obvious on the basis of the blinded event rate was that if we were to recruit around about 2,000 patients to an active arm compared with around 4,000 uh, controls, then we would have 90% power at 0 .0, a p-value of 0 0.01 to detect a 20% reduction, proportional reduction in, in all-cause mortality. We had some debate about whether actually smaller reductions in all-cause mortality might actually be uh, important in this context. And the answer is, of course, they would, but it was felt that that was in, simply infeasible even in a study that was rolling as fast as this. Um, but on the basis that we had passed 2,000 patients randomized, the, the steering committee determined that we should stop uh, um, enrollment into the dexamethasone arm uh, and, um, uh, and uh, look at the data. So this was uh, a result that we announced on the 16th of June. Uh, what you can see is that again, uh, around um, uh, two thirds of the patients are, are male. Again, the age, the age range is shown with about 20% over 70 to 79 and 20% over 80. Um, and if you look at the bottom, uh, that's around 16, 15 or 16% of these patients uh, on me mechanical ventilation with a further 60% requiring oxygen with or without non-invasive ventilation. And the results have now been uh, published. Uh, uh, the uh, panel on the left is taken from that publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, overall, there's a, uh, there was a 17% proportional uh, reduction in the risk of death. But, um, and this is an unusual case, the, there was clear evidence of a statistical trend in the size of the effect dependent on what, what level of oxygen or, uh, or respiratory support people were receiving at baseline. The p-value on that is less than 0, 0, 0, 0001. So this is one of those examples where the overall result is, if you like, a weighted average of really three quite different results in the different subgroups. And if one looks in the invasive mechanical ventilation group, the reduction in the risk of death uh, is around about a third. In those who require oxygen um, with or without non-invasive ventilation, it's uh, just about a fifth. And in those who do not require any form of respiratory support, they don't require oxygen, uh, then uh, there was no evidence of any benefit of dexamethasone. And that does of course fit with the biology in the clinical picture in that it's when the, um, uh, the immune system ceases to be your friend against the virus and turns out to be uh, somewhat less friendly against the lungs uh, in the later stages of disease uh, where um, immunosuppression uh, turns out to be uh, most useful. So it's included in the protocol of 13th of March. We recruited, uh, we, we stopped recruitment on day 81. On day 89, uh, we announced the results on the 16th of June. Uh, this result has, has had a pretty dramatic effect. And one thing to recognize is that dexamethasone six milligrams daily costs about, I'll translate, it costs around 10 to $20 uh, for a 10 day course in the US. It probably costs less than $1 in many other parts of the world. It's on the WHO's essential medicines list. It's available in pretty much every pharmacy, in pretty much every hospital, in pretty much every country of the world. Um, and this was what, again, one of those rare examples where uh, there has been not only speed from including in the protocol to getting an answer, but from getting an answer to getting it into practice. In this instance, four hours uh, between uh, making the result publicly known at lunchtime um, and uh, the chief medical officers uh, across the UK writing to every NHS hospital in the country saying uh, that under these in this circumstance, given this clear mortality advantage with good significance and a well-known medicine which is safe under these circumstances, we, re we consider it reasonable for practice to change in advance of the final paper and indeed it has done exactly that. Uh, so this is, if you like, you, you, you announce a result at lunchtime, the guideline is being used, the result is being used by tea time and by the weekend lives are being saved. Um, uh, it's a, it, it's uh, an extraordinary result, not necessarily one that 
anybody was uh, necessarily expecting. If one looks internationally, then um, uh, the WHO have welcomed the results and are considering upgrade, up the upgrade uh, to their guidelines and the NIH have, do, have done likewise. Uh, and as I say, the previous guidelines by a number of bodies um, were uh, that uh, dexamethasone was contraindicated. And there has really been a turnaround of that among patients who require oxygen or uh, more aggressive forms of um, or intensive forms of respiratory support. It is not a treatment for patients in the outpatient setting in the community or with the er earlier forms of disease that are not impacting on the lung function. And the final result is uh, lapinavir ritonavir, um, uh, a result that's gone sort of somewhat unnoticed, which is, uh, I, I guess, fine in that um, that's what you'd expect when you see a null result. But this is, a, this is a tr the treatment which was either first or second choice, alternating with hydroxychloroquine in so many guidelines. So widely available, widely affordable treatment, uh, but it was quite clear uh, that this, is a, this was a drug uh, that does not lower uh, the risk of uh, death among these patients, uh, and there was no impact on any of the other outcomes that we've talked about. And again, picked up um, uh, in, the, uh, in the UK, uh, in the US, uh, and in India and worldwide. So a practice changing results. So the question is what next? Um, we still have three of the, of the original arms, uh, treatment uh, arms uh, ongoing. The first is azithromycin. There's ne nearly 3000 patients in that comparison. But remember it's a, a one to two randomization. So that's about a thousand patients on azithromycin. So if you like, that's about halfway there. Uh, and we anticipate results uh, sometime in the, um, in the fall or, or, or in the fourth quarter. The second is tocilizumab, uh, the interleukin-6 antagonist, which given the results for dexamethasone is a, a really interesting proposition, but as many of you will know, uh, Vosch's own trial, the Covacta trial, which was only about half the size of the number of patients we've got to date, um, uh, did not show any impact on uh, mortality. There was a suggestion of, a, well, there was a reduction in um, uh, the duration of hospital stay, um, uh, but um, that was not, uh, uh, they couldn't com declare significance given the way that the statistical analysis was constructed. Um, so we're ongoing study of 840 patients of tocilizumab and then uh, convalescent plasma, which I'm sure we will return to in discussion, uh, where we currently have 330 patients randomized one to one. Now, 330 patients to me is a, is a, is a small number, a tiny number. Um, uh, and what we have seen in the UK is that caseload has fallen way off at the moment. Great news. Uh, we don't anticipate that to last. And we're looking ahead, but perhaps not looking forward uh, to, the, uh, to the autumn and winter uh, when we expect caseload to rise. And we've used this summer really to do two things. One is to do training and roll out across all the transfusion labs uh, and the harvesting of the plasma. And the other is to plan ahead for that next wave. And so agents under consideration, a range of other, if you like, repurpose antivirals, thinking about what about thrombosis, thinking about what one might do uh, next about immun immunomodulatory agents. Um, and of course, finally thinking about what about the monoclonal antibodies uh, where there's so much interest at the moment. There are two other th points I just want to touch on. And the one is that actually part of the what next is if we can do this for COVID in a crisis, what could we do if we, if we uh, took these lessons and, and played them out elsewhere? Well, the first is, uh, is very actively adapting the platform for future outbreaks. And that could be the next pandemic, but actually there is a, uh, uh, you know, an outbreak every winter of seasonal influenza, of respiratory syncytial virus, and so on. Um, and so could we adapt this platform um, for uh, those sorts of infections? The answer is absolutely yes. And the finally is disseminating the, letter, the lessons for both COVID-19 worldwide, uh, particularly to parts of the world where there are large numbers of cases, but also disseminating the lessons for non-COVID clinical trials. The thing about COVID is it is called a major health crisis, but it has not solved or cured cancer, diabetes, osteoarthritis, or mental health. And there's as much need for streamlined, highly efficient, 
uh, assessment and evaluation of treatments through randomized clinical trials in those conditions as there is in COVID. So I'll, I'll finish by saying thank you to the team. People say, well, you need enormous numbers of people. Actually, what you need is relatively few, very special people. This is about half the total team um, uh, that have made this happen in, in the coordinating centre in Oxford. Um, and, and also thank you beyond the team because there have been something like 3,000 plus uh, doctors, nurses, uh, pharmacists and others up and down the country who have actually been the people who've been seeing the, patient, the, the patients. We've taken a very deliberate approach right from the beginning about transparency and communication. So everything about this trial is, that we can make available publicly, we have made available publicly. So uh, recruitment numbers are, on, uh, are online, the, the consent form, the protocol, the regulatory submission documents, the training materials, the data monitoring committee um, uh, uh, letters, uh, all of that material is available online uh, for both uh, professionals and lay members, whether they be patients, relatives, media, politicians, or other just interested members of the public uh, to, to uh, take part of. I've got to acknowledge the funders at the top half of this, but also to acknowledge the sort of infrastructure that has made this possible in the UK. Uh, the UK is, uh, has, I, I think, achieved something outstanding in this last few months, um, but it would not have been possible without uh, some of that infrastructure. But that infrastructure is not unique uh, to the UK. The US has much of the same tools. The question is about how we use them. And so finally, finally, I wanted to thank the, the, the patients who participated in their, in their family members. I think on a grand round, I think when uh, we talk about COVID, when we talk about research, we very often talk about the numbers. We very talk, often talk about the results or the drugs or, the, or, or uh, get excited uh, about what we may or may not have found. But behind every one of those numbers is a person. Um, and it's those people that is the reason why we do this research. Thank you. Dr. Landry, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I'm going to ask if you don't mind to un yeah, perfect, unshare. And uh, we certainly have a lot of questions coming and many more come up as well. But before we get to the questions, I want to turn it over to Dr. Califf for any comments and any questions he may have for you, Dr. Landry. Well, as I expected, that was a masterful presentation from the now professor. I knew Mark when he was just a mere, I'm not sure what your role was to start out, but um, I, th I think you made a couple of really important points that I want to reiterate and then give, a, uh, give you one question. I mean, you've really rediscovered ISIS, as you uh, correctly said, with uh, the streamlining, but you've added a couple of other elements, the use of EHRs for follow-up in some organization and, and the organization of the NHS so that um, you were able to deploy this thing without going through a thousand IRBs and subcommittees and all that and, and the buy-in of the NHS. Now, I imagine you also didn't have to pay the investigators because they were paid um, on salary for their effort. So that gets to my uh, question. Maybe it's a two-part question. We've talked about, is any of this possible for the United States? And you've been more optimistic than I have about it, I must say. But in particular, um, what about the role of the clinician? Uh, did it bother any of the clinicians in the UK that they weren't first author on the papers or getting academic credit? Uh, do you see that as an issue? Um, what, what is your advice for how to get the clinicians involved? Because for this kind of trial, as, you, as I think you said very well, you can have a small central trial team, but unless the clinicians are um, approaching the patients and asking, uh, no one will enroll. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, doctors are paid to be doctors. I'm a doctor. And part of the job of being a doctor is to, is to help work out which treatments work and which ones don't. And giving a treatment arbitrarily, willy-nilly, um, uh, is actually not being a very good doctor, particularly if there is a clinical trial that you could take part in. Now, much of medicine, as we all know, there isn't a clinical trial you can easily do, so you have no other option. 
Um, so I think the secret was you make sure that there's a trial available. The, the health service leaders said doing this clinical trial is to be seen as part of clinical care. They said that to the chief executives of every individual hospital, and they said it's to the medical directors of in every individual hospital, and they said it to the Royal Colleges, so the professional bodies um, that, that uh, med uh, medics and nurses uh, uh, belong to. And the feedback from on the ground was, at last, we can get involved in a clinical trial um, rather than just read about it. This is not something that only special people who are called professor work in an academic institution or work for pharma or a CRO can do. We can get involved. And they have actually enjoyed that, that liberation, which actually is where, when I was a medical student and a very junior doctor in the early days of, of, of myocardial infarction trials, that's exactly where it was. Dr. Harrington, can I ask you to comment in here? Yeah, uh, Martin, first off, spectacular presentation, very clear, and uh, I'll add my congratulations to, uh, to Rob's. So it's, it's really it's sort of the re rediscovering of the past, and, uh, and uh, it's really been an impressive set of accomplishment. I, I want to build on something you've said to make sure that the audience um, hears it. There was a New York Times article this past week on the tension that exists between frontline clinicians and, uh, and researchers. And it was largely based out of the New York experience where, um, where clinicians just felt overwhelmed and that they had to do something. And, uh, and the clinical research community criticizing that for a lot of the reasons you said, you know, doing something willy nilly doesn't necessarily add value and why can't we systematically study it? I, I want then to build on that to ask you the question with something you said almost in passing. You said the academic centers enrolled very few patients, um, maybe two, three percent of the patients as opposed to the one in six. Why is that? Were the academics confident that they knew what was going on? Did the academics have something else that they were doing? Were they trying to do their own trials, which actually were, you know, to use Dr. Kalos phrase, SCT, small crappy trials where they couldn't actually answer questions? What, what was going on? Yeah, so to be clear, not all academic centres were the same. So there were some really good ones. I mean, so the, the, the top centre, uh, which recruited on its own something like 700 patients, one centre, is an academic centre. Um, so they're not all the same. I guess my point is that typically uh, uh, academics, when they're looking for somebody to collaborate with, they look out for other academics. They look down the list of professors or the societies or whatever it is. And actually the thing to do is look where the patients are. And the patients are not always coming, coming to the big academic hospitals. That's one thing. And secondly, the big academic hospitals may have many other things that they're doing. Now, some of them may or may not be, um, in Dr. Caleb's view, uh, worthwhile um, uh, or might be distracting or whatever else. I make no judgment about that. Uh, but the reality is that often big academic centers um, are busy places where lots of other stuff is happening. But my fundamental point would be, yeah, you rob banks because that's where the money is. If you want to recruit to to trials, you go where the you go where the patients are, and then you make it easy both for the patient and for the clinician. And the question, which is why I put that quote in from the ICS two protocol, is how do you um, how do you make that um, as easy as possible? How do you make it ideally as easy to randomise as it is to prescribe? Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Landry. Uh, Dr. Landry, after the recovery trial came out, uh, naturally, a lot of us were trying to figure out where was going to be our cutoff for patients who get steroids or not. Um, one of our faculty members, Dr. Capagoda, an amazing infectious disease doctor with us, was part of that group of discussants trying to figure out the best cutoffs. She's asking, do you have any subgroup analysis data from the recovery trial from people on one to two liters of oxygen? We have a lot of patients who do well in remdesivir and go home. And of course, as you know, the non-significant trend towards uh, harm uh, people with no oxygen. Uh, and also given that our mortality rates are closer to 10%, um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, a uh, couple of things. I mean, we, first of all, we didn't classify the people in the oxygen, what we call oxygen only, but it's oxygen, it includes a, a couple of liters of oxygen via nasal uh, cannulae through to um, some form of fairly um, intensive uh, non-invasive ventilation. We just didn't classify that or, or divide that up. But within that group, what one sees is, is benefit and, and one doesn't see outright harm in the people who, are, um, who, who don't require oxygen at all. 
So I think that by and large, uh, one other point is that we did train people that what we were looking for was COVID, not um, just infection. And so we were actually looking for people with the disease, uh, not, people, not people who happened to have a test positive. Now, back in March, that was a much clearer picture. Now, that pro if we're doing it again now, that's perhaps arguably less clear because lots of people go to hospital and everybody gets tested. And then you've got the, this issue about who's got disease and who hasn't. Um, but I think it, yeah, there are, I think one can try to, to, too hard to, re, to, to try and draw a distinction there. I, I'd be much more worried that we're withholding dexamethasone from a bunch of people who could, who could likely benefit from it by and large. Thank you. Um, one of our uh, pulmonary critical care doctors, Dr. Rogers, who's an, an, uh, our, uh, an expert in ARDS, um, she asks, uh, prior ARDS cohorts have been shown that steroids, oh, just lost that question here. Um, she's asking about the effects of steroids uh, and um, it's been shown to have effect in ARDS patients, negative effects long-term. Do you have any data on patients uh, on the vent at 28 days? Uh, not yet. We will get long-term effects. I mean, one of the things is that many of the previous studies were either non-randomized or they were of much higher doses of steroids, um, large doses of methylpred, for example, which I think is a one. Of, I think there's an issue in our steroid data, you know, as in a lesson, which is it's about dose and timing. Um, uh, so you've got to, you, these are patients who are um, sick enough that the lungs have, uh, are, are starting to fail um, and that the dose is relatively low. Okay, gotcha. Um, this next question, I'd love to also get uh, uh, both Dr. Landry and Dr. Caleb's uh, input on. When enrolling patients at such amazing speed, how do you ensure robust informed consent, uniform trial protocols, and large number of diverse trial sites? Dr. Landry, maybe I'll start with you and then uh, get Dr. Caleb's input as well. Well, when you're breathless and you're in hospital, how much can you actually take on board and what do you want to know? Start at that point. Well, that's what informed consent is about, is about, is actually providing the information that patients want to know. We had a two page consent form, um, which, uh, and supported by training and training videos, and people could always look up the extra detail where we needed to. I think that is actually way more consent than patients would have given if they were just prescribed hydroxychloroquine, where they would give no consent at all, essentially. So again, it's about this proportionality um, and then about training. Great. And Dr. Caleb? Yeah, I'd make a couple of points. First, um, uh, you know, there's a thing called quality by design that Martin has championed along with many of my old friends from the FDA, which means find out what's important and focus on that, uh, a point he already made. I'd also say we all know that um, so-called informed consent, particularly the way the U.S. has handled it, has been a major misfire. And there's ample documentation of uh, lack of comprehension when we have long single pa spaced consent forms that patients can't actually read. So um, I really think COVID um, has enabled us now in not just these trials, but many others to use more appropriate consent. And I think the use of video afterwards to give people all the additional information they need <clears throat> is a big direction that will go. But you also brought up uh, co uh, comprehensive protocols. And it's not just the consent, but also the protocol ought to only include the things that you really need to do. And I think we make a big mistake in many clinical trials of adding all sorts of useless stuff to the protocol that really doesn't matter. And the last point I'd make, you know, this per pertains to a particular type of clinical trial the pragmatic clinical trial meant to answer a question for practice. There are many other reasons to do clinical trials dealing with pathophysiology, um, expl explanation of mechanism, et cetera, where you may want to do all that extra stuff, but, but we shouldn't confuse that for this kind of a trial. And I think that's a big mistake that we've made. Just look at the elegance of getting uh, the overall answer with um, uh, tremendous power compared to, uh, and Martin said he wasn't going to take a position on this. Martin, you have to take a position. It, I, I will take it a well-done pathophysiology trial in an academic center is a splendid thing. But if we look at the record in clinicaltrials.gov, the vast majority of these trials either never finish 
or never get published. So they can't be worth a whole lot. In the meanwhile, these people could be enrolling in trials that really answer the questions. Yeah, that's absolutely right, actually. I mean, it just seemed to me back in March, and it still seems to me, that you, you've, 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 you've got this enormous problem in terms of the number of cases. You've got a one in four ch patients with a one in four chance of dying, and you don't know how to treat them. Now, the number one thing is to find some treatment. And uh, if you can find something that impacts on mortality, benefits of mortality, then, you're, then you can use it worldwide instantly. Actually, we, we can go back and fill in the dots of why does it work. It, in this particular context, I don't think it matters actually why it works. It will do in the, in the long run because we'll need to work out what's about improved treatments and so on and so forth. But right at the time when you're facing that fire, then you, then you want to work, you, you want to find the, a treatment that, that is effective. And that has to be the priority. Yeah, I'm also glad you brought up the Roche trial because uh, the only physical activity I can do right now that has social distancing is golf. And I play golf with the chief medical officer at Roche. And I've said, why did you, you must have collected tons of data that was useless in your 350 patient trial. What have you done in a thousand person trial with mortality as endpoint? How do you know you wouldn't have gotten a different lasting answer? Uh, and to be fair, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, uh, not. I don't know the people. But what Roche did do, Roche UK did, was donate enough drug for, to treat two thousand patients to to the trial, and basically said, "Here's the drug. You do the trial, and we'll keep out of your. Uh, we'll we'll support you, but we'll keep out of your way." They didn't provide us with money. They didn't provide us, but they also didn't try to control things. And effectively, what we are doing is we've already got a trial which is twice as big as anything, as anything else uh, of tocilizumab and we will effectively be giving them that simple mortality trial um, for very little cost or effort. Um, uh, people said, well, what about the regulations? You, know, you, you will never get regulatory approval. Well, I think it's a really brave regulator that says here's a treatment that reduces mortality by a third amongst patients who've got a 40% chance of dying uh, in a condition where we have no other treatments. And the regulator says, no, we're not going to approve that. Now, yeah, so in a sense, my, my position was, find the evidence, make it so compelling that actually people have to take notice. Uh, Dr. Harrington, did you have some comments? Well, well it, you know, this is just such a refreshing conversation around uh, how to get things done. As you know, that the NIH is struggling to get things up and going because as, uh, as many, including Rob, have pointed out, we don't have a system in the US. We have a bunch of hospitals and a bunch of health systems who have their own self-interest and not necessarily thinking about working collaboratively together. So that's the challenge that we have. Rob, I wanna ask you something about consent, which is that you'll remember back in the ISIS two days that the Americans were criticized by the ISIS group for not get, maybe it was ISIS one days of not getting enrollment up and going because our informed consent and contracts and everything else took so long. It's no different today. Where do you think the main lesion is? Is moving to central IRB is going to fix this? Is it going to help it? Where's the lesion where we can have a two page informed consent form with uh, videos, cartoons, et cetera, to get true consent? I, um, how many hours do you have? No. I mean, I think the short answer is um, we need to have a societal argument now, given what we've seen with COVID, about what we're gonna do post COVID. Should it be the default, as Martin said, that you protect people from randomized trials? Or should it be the default that given appropriate oversight, enrolling in a randomized trial is actually a positive aspect of participation in both delivery of healthcare, but also uh, being a patient in a healthcare system. And I think we've gotten it um, wrong, but we also have to acknowledge that if we go too far the other way, there will be a repeat of the egregious problems that we had before with exploitation. So I, th I think we need to rebalance. And I don't think there is a single magic bullet. I think it's gonna take a very deep uh, discussion. And we need academic leaders like you to step up on this. I mean, I do I think, 
I do think that one, it's about being, it's about proportionality. So the alternative, if you put a big consent form in, in the way, uh, one, it doesn't inform, so it doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do. It's, 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 it's not an informed consent form. It's a legal document which, which people either sign or they don't. And it's, it's largely designed to defend the, the, the institutions. And that's not, that's not information. That's not informed consent. The second is if, in proportionality, you can either throw treatment, deny people treatments, throw treatments at them or randomize them. And if you don't know what you're doing, and we, at the beginning of COVID, we didn't know what we're doing and largely we still don't know what we're doing, then it's as reasonable to randomize as it is to, uh, as it is anything else. And at least then you learn. And this is what we've seen, of course, with convalescent plasma in different parts of the world is that vast quantities have been used and little has been learned. Um, you know, I, I, th I think we have to put this in, in the context of, of what is you know, usual care and what does usual care look like? How much consent is given every time you prescribe a drug? I'd suggest almost none. Great. Um, guys, thank, there's certain days I, I wish, uh, oftentimes find myself wishing grand rounds was twice as long. Today is one of those days. If you're okay, uh, if we could go for a few more minutes, just get a few more questions and hear from me, I'd love to. Um, the next one up, Dr. Uh, Barry, Michelle Barry, who's presenting next week on the gender lens in, in COVID-19 asks, uh, there's typically more women that recruit in, into the hydroxy and dexamethasone test, 64 to 36 percent. Can you explain why equal numbers of women get infected, albeit more males die glo globally? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, uh, or was it? I the I, sure. it's, it's, we, we, by and large, we had two, th two thirds men in all the studies, in, 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 throughout the study. Yeah, it was, I think that, it was the opposite. So there were more men. Okay. Yeah, and, and that reflects the number of the proportion of uh, uh, men versus women who were coming into hospital. So it's very, very in line with, with the case mix that we see. And the same is true with, um, uh, you'd call it race, um, the proportion of the black, Asian or minority ethnic groups, as we, which is, which is uh, the UK sort of definition or description, uh, was around 18% or so, which again is very similar to what one sees. And this, I think, speaks to several things. First of all, is it's a, a very inclusive trial in terms of there's, there are not a whole bunch of restrictions. Uh, the second is it was running in every hospital and you know if one only goes to places where there is a particular segment of society one will only recruit patients from that particular segment of society if in fact actually what we what happens is you run the trial in uh, a more diverse set of locations you will end up with a more diverse set of patients gotcha um can i ask you uh so talking about uh the uh, dexamethasone and its effect on hyperglycemia, Dr. Uh, Jankovic asks, uh, you know, as you may know, it can worsen outcomes. Is there any subgroup analysis in the effects of dexamethasone on blood sugars and outcomes in recovery? We didn't study that in recovery. Um, and the rationale for that was we know, as, as the question has said, we know what dexamethasone does to blood sugars. That's number one. Um, and number two, we also know how to treat that. And number three, that by and large, um, that with that being monitored and managed in hospital, then actually the number of people who come to harm from, you know, serious harm from that is, 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 is very small by comparison with what the potential benefits might be. As the results have transpired, we're looking at all cause mortality. So if, and it seems unlikely, dexamethasone increased a few deaths from diabetes uh, or glucose control, is that then actually it's the effects on the COVID part were even greater. So in a sense, one, one's wrapping that all in. But this again is part of, this is a known drug. We know what we're dealing with. We know what the side effects, we learn with them all at medical school. We monitor, the, we monitor accordingly, we treat accordingly. We don't need to study that all over again. What we need to, what we need to know is whether it impacts on mortality in this context. Uh, we have about, we're definitely going over here. I'll, I'll maybe ask one or two more questions. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but um, Dr. Kalwani asks, uh, and perhaps this is a quick question I'd love to hear from both uh, Dr. Landry and Khalif. Uh, Khalif, um, is the national healthcare system a necessity prerequisite to conduct a trial at this scale, scale and speed? Does NHS, was that the key part to this or was it an, a key part to this? Can this be done elsewhere? If I thought that the NHS was the only place that could do this, uh, um, I wouldn't necessarily be on this on this ground round. 
um, my reason for spending a lot of time speaking, particularly in the US, is that I think this exactly is the sort of thing that can be done elsewhere. You, ha you have very large healthcare providers. You have very large collaboratives of one sort or another. You have a huge number, a huge population, it's sadly a huge number of patients. You have great academia. Uh, you have all the resources. You have the finance. Um, uh, you know, everything is there. Um, the infrastructure, the tools are there. The question is actually working out how to uh, assemble the parts into into an efficient machine. Gotcha. Dr. Keyleth, any thoughts? Yeah, um, it's not hopeless. We used to do these routinely. Dr. Harrington actually was one of the leaders of doing trials of 10 to 40,000 people with very large U.S. enrollment. So I think it's entirely possible. But I think the fragmentation of our healthcare system that makes us in last place for health outcomes among economically advantaged countries also is putting us in a very big disadvantage here. So I think what it really takes is organization and what Martin said, make it easy for the clinician and then things can really happen. So it's not a, it's not a lost cause, but we'd better get to work. If you Excellent. look at some of the real world data, if I may, that's come out, if you look at some of the reports that are coming out, I can't remember which part of New York it was, I'm sorry, where people have given, have reported on the use of hydroxychloroquine in 1,500 to 2,000 patients. Actually, that's enough patients to get a pretty compelling answer, but it wasn't randomized. If you look at 50,000 patients given convalescent plasma, where the protocol was simplified, rural hospitals were included, the production was, and, uh, was scaled up, everything is done, except that, and there's no randomization so the scale and the and this and the coordination is there um it's just remember to toss the coin and also remember don't make it complicated it's easy to make something simple complicated excellent dr harrington yeah martin i think you've hit the key theme which is that we've got to get back to where research is not run in parallel to clinical practice but it's part of clinical practice and you and rob will both remember the gusto one days where more than half the patients came from the U.S. of a 40,000 patient clinical trial. So, Rob, you know, we, we can do it. We've got the, as you say, all of the component pieces. We've just got to return to that ethos of, uh, of getting people to see this as part of the practice of medicine as opposed to see it as a sidebar to the practice of medicine. And, and, and that's, that's something we got to continue to work on. And uh, in the New York example, uh, the people who are doing the convalescent plasma is is a great example. I mean, we should know the answer to that by now. And it, in some ways, it's an embarrassment that we don't. Thanks, Dr. Harrington. I'll end on this last question. It's perhaps my favorite question coming from Jyoti Sarma. I can't let either of you guys go today without getting your opinions on when are we going to have a vaccine and how good is it going to be? Dr. Landry. I'm not a vaccinologist. Um, uh, one thing I would say is that um, there's one thing to have a vaccine. There's another thing to have to have the, the vaccine used in, su in sufficient scale in the right places at the right price. And so uh, it's you're just getting the same is true with drugs, but just getting an answer and finding something that works is not enough. And one has to look through beyond that into actually how it gets delivered. The second thing I'd say is that is that we there are many diseases where we've been working on vaccines for, for 30 or 40 years. And have not found one. And the third, what the third thing I'd say is, even when we have, oh, I think uh, he just froze for a moment. Dr. Landry, can you hear me? Oh, he froze. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Well, Dr. Caleb, I guess. Oh, I, oh. I could, I could be cheeky and say Vladimir Putin announced that we already have <laughs> one. So why are you asking the question now? But I, th you know. It's hard to disagree with Martin, but I th if I were a betting person, I'd say we'll have an effective vaccine that's proven by the end of the year. It'll be partially effective, not completely, but very useful. And it'll take till next summer to have it completely scaled up until next fall to have it, you know, available for billions of people. And by it, I don't mean one vaccine. I think there'll be more than one. But I, don't, I see this as likely more like the flu vaccine it'll ameliorate the disease, but not eradicate it. Like, you know, I was going to say, talk about big trials, polio, the U.S. randomized entire states in the polio vaccine trials in the 1950s. Mm 
So we're, you know, we're like 70 years catching up with what was done, done then. And, um, you know, very optimistic, despite the, the appropriate caveats that Martin gave. Thanks so much, Dr. Kayla. Uh, Dr. Langer, you cut off at the end. Anything else you wanted to add before we close? No, I, no, I, I think that's, the points have been made, but um, thank you very much for having me. Mark, uh, thanks for joining us. It's been really a, a privilege to have you. And same to you, Rob. Thanks for taking time to join us. Errol, I'll let you close. Wonderful. Well, as always, thanks for those of you who are able to stick with us. Uh, uh, it's at 9-11 now. We will get this video out to everybody. And uh, Dr. Landry, we have a lot of questions we'll send to you if there's any you can answer. Um, I know you're busy. We'll try to, we'll certainly get those out to everybody as well. So again, thank you everybody for being with us. Thank you to our panelists for answering all the number of questions as well. And thanks, Dr. Harrington. I hope everybody has a great week. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you.